Jerry Cabral, tell us what's new with my sleep.
uh, but no zero day and no zero end date. So those SQL modes are actually in strict mode. So you don't need to put them in. So they're, you can't actually use them as an SQL mode by themselves, but they're now part of strict mode. So strict all table and strict tran trans tables. More cleanup. Uh, alter table ignore. Um, you can, if you were adding, say, alter table add index, or you were adding something that, and then there was a duplicate key, so alter table add primary key or something like that, and there's a duplicate, you could have said ignore the 45.7 um, to not error on doing key issues. Um, but that's going away because you kind of want to error on it. Um, storage engine is going away because you should really be using default storage engine. So again, these are like tiny minor things, and I just want to whip through them first. Um, but if you do have a question, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll go to it. Thread concurrency. This variable is very misleading. Um, it's actually only used on Solaris 8. And uh, if you're on Solaris 8, you probably have bigger problems than thread <laughs> concurrency, because it is 2014. So they're removing the variable. And if people want to complain to Oracle that you're on Solaris 8, um, they probably won't listen. Because I think they're pretty much not developing Solaris at all. So no, that's not true. Oh, that's not true. They're Good. Tell me. Solaris. They are still developing oh, Solaris. Yeah. Great. <laughs> I haven't used Solaris since 2001, so they're announcing 11.2 next week. Awesome. Solaris 11.2 is coming. Great. I love it when I don't have the right information and somebody has the right information. That makes me so excited. Uh, delayed in 5. So delayed was deprecated in 5.6. So insert delayed, replace delayed. That whole thing was deprecated meaning that the delay function no longer works, so it no longer does the batch inserts with the delay, but it would still recognize it and just make it a regular insert. Um, so now if you try to use insert delay to replace delay, you get a warning that says insert delay is no longer supported, statement was converted to insert. So it's doing this already in 5.6 quietly, but now they're telling you. And maybe in 5.8 they'll remove it. MySQL bin log no longer writes delayed, so that was kind of nice. So it would actually write delayed in the bin log so that a slave would then pick it up and ignore it. <laughs> um, and then the, there were columns in the performance schema in some tables that had to deal with delayed. I didn't bother to write them all out. Um, and then there's also a MySQL with um, delayed insert option. Um, that's also there. So again, a lot of these are stuff you probably never used, and that's pretty much why they're being deprecated. There are some things that are being simplified. Um, the EnoDB table monitor. Who's used this table monitor? So this is, this is what you have to do. Create a table, MySQL, the EDB monitor, A int, N equals to B, and it spews a whole bunch of stuff into the error log. Um, it's a pain. And then you have to remember to drop the table to turn it off. Otherwise, after a couple of days, you're disciplined. Now, it's set global EDB status output equals on. And clearly, it's a dynamic variable because you want all the servers running. That's the good news. The bad news is it still spews everything into the error log in, in like a human readable and not machine readable. Similar with the EnoDB lock monitor, instead of doing that, now it's EnoDB stat status output locks equals on. So that's good. They're kind of standardizing stuff. Great. Lots of cleanup. So more simplification. Show engine EnoDB mutex. It's gone. Um, it's totally removed, and you're supposed to just do some queries on performance schema and put a view on performance schema, which makes sense. Um, information schema at profiling, so show profiles and all that kind of stuff, that's gone. Um, and again, you just use performance schema. Table and table space monitor, so the EnoDB table monitor, um, those are changing the information schema on tables. So it's all this kind of standardization and stuff, right, that Oracle's doing. Um, there's some clarification. Instead of encode and decode those functions, so if you ever have like insert into a table, encode password or something like that, um, it's now just going to say use AES and encode with AES. Not a, big, not a big deal, but you know, if you use that in your code, you're going to want to change it. So there are some things that are long overdue. Um, warnings for using old passwords. This is a MySQL 4.1 thing. They changed it 4.1. Pre-4.1 is all the old passwords. And let's see, 5.1 came out, 5.0 came out in 2005. So I don't even remember when 4.1 came out. So you're using passwords that are old. You're using a password encryption scheme that's older than 10 years. Um, hmm? 1998, yeah. It's, it's old. It's, it's really old, and it's, it's like a 16-character hash instead of a 40 or 41-character hash. Um, automatic password expiration. So 
five, six, MySQL did stuff where you can have role accounts. You can manually expire an account to say, you know, your password's gonna expire, and the next time you log in, you have to change it, and you can do it automatically. Uh, RPM deployments now have no anonymous users, so blank at localhost, that's gone. Um, no test database, which is great. Um, and it only installs the root at localhost user. No like root at 192.168. Now whatever. Um, and it gives it a random password, which is then stored in home dot mysql underscore secret, which is great so that you know where it is. But you know, as a dot so it's kind of hidden. And it's got all the right permissions. Um, but it is kind of annoying to have like we're going to give you a random password, and here's where everyone's going to know where it is. <laughs> that is for root at local host. If you if you now this is a, on a clean installation, right? If you don't have anything when you're doing like MySQL install DB, that it's going to it's going to give you a new password. So your root at local host it installs, but it's not a blank password like it usually is. It does give you a random password. So there's a little bit of security when you first install. And which is why it's on the long overdue stuff. After you change the password, can you remove that? After you change the password, can you remove that? Absolutely. You can remove the root of localhost user if you want entirely and call it something like Super or Joe, as long as you give it all the privileges. <coughs> Anything else? Great. There's a whole bunch of new stuff, too. Um, so I'm going to talk about all the MySQL new stuff, and then I'm going to go back and talk about the Maria new stuff. Um, the test suite now uses EnoDB as default. Great. Welcome to the rest of the world, right? Everyone's using EnoDB. Uh, there's a new China national standard uh, character set, GB18030. If you need this, you probably know, know it. Um, <coughs> here's something interesting. Control C cancels the current query. That's what it does currently in 5, 6, and, and below. But if there's no query, it exits. This changes in 5, 7. So here's what happens currently. Your query, you're not in the middle of the query, you hit control C and it exits and says aborted. That's not going to happen in 5.7. This is just going to sit there and be like, control C. Which is great because I'm always hitting my control C, control D, I'm always any control thing. Um, EnoDB full text search, which was live in 5.6. Is anyone using EnoDB full text search? Great. We just changed our Mozilla implementation to that. Now, who else uses Mozilla? No. <laughs> I know, I know. We're almost up to a million bugs, though. It's been like 10 years. So, um, EnoDB full text search was introduced in 5.6. There is the full text parser plugin support. So, people have been really like, oh, I need, I, I won't switch until I can, I don't know, port my, my plugins that I wrote for it. Now you can. Uh, spatial data. Who here uses spatial data? Maybe use Postgres for it because my skill is not really good at spatial data. Yeah, it's okay. You can tell, I, I actually manage Postgres machines too, so it's, it's all good. Um, Postgres is famous for. Yeah. For yeah. Carl is saying that Postgres is famous for geospatial data and the fact that it can handle it really well. And my skills would be famous for not handling it well. The good news is in 5, so in 5.6, it kind of handled it as you put it in a blob data type, um, but you still kind of play with it. In 5.7, it's a, still a blob data type internally, but when you like actually define it in the table and use it, it's a data geometry data type. So, uh, temporary tables in EnoDB. There's a separate table space for non-compressed temporary tables. I haven't played around with temporary tables too much. I don't know, like what's clearly the, there's a point to compressing them, and some people do. Um, and then that separate table space can actually set the path of where that shows up. So by default, the, that table will show up in the data directory, but if you want it in slash temp or something, because maybe that's memory backed, you can uh, change the file path. Metadata is no longer going to be in the EnoDB system tables. Uh, reports and metadata are all going to, on all of the EnoDB temporary tables, um, including user created and system, so everything, including those intermediate query, when you have a long query and the system makes intermediate temporary tables, all that stuff is not going to be in the EnoDB system tables. It's going to be a new table called EnoDB Temp Table Info, which at least that's a good name. MySQL has always named things well in the past, so this is great. Um, but it's only for active temporary tables, right? Because once it's not active, it's gone because it was temporary, uh, which is great because if you have like a long running query and stuff like that, you can now look at, uh, I believe that's an information schema table to see, hey, what's going on with that. 
Uh, but here's an interesting tidbit. This is a magic table. If you go look for it and you like install 5.7 and you're like, let me see if this table shows up and show tables from information schema. It doesn't. It only shows up until uh, when you select it for the first time. So magic. There's more magic tables actually. Well, that's in Maria. Uh, performance enhancements. We love, love for things to go faster. Um, flushing dirty buffer pool pages. Um, we now have a variable for EnoDB page cleaners. So in MySQL 5.6, they introduced this thing called a page cleaner, which was just basically taking the one task of flushing the dirty pages, which is pages that had data written to them, flushing them to disk, right? So saving it to disk after you've written something. That got separated out in 5.6, and I think there. Separated out in 5.6 to be a separate thread, so that reading and writing happen their own threads, and then saving to disk happens its own threads. So that was a, that was a performance win in 5.6. An even bigger one in 5.7 is that you can now have more uh, EnoDB page cleaners. Uh, and then there, they also said that there's also performance enhancements for create, drop, trunk, and alter, but they didn't really say what they were. <laughs> so, uh, bin log dump thread locking uh, is what it sounds like when you're doing a binary log dump with like MySQL bin log. Um, so there is a, a lock held when reading an event. Um, not when you're using MySQL bin log, when you're doing replication, something's reading. Um, Whenever, let's say you have 10 slaves, right? Each of those slaves goes to read an event and locks the table, which means that the writer thread can't write while it's reading. It's got a shared lock, um, and the writer thread can't write. Now, the lock is only held, held when you're reading the end of the last bin log event, which makes sense, right? That's because that's where it would write to, because it's a, um, it's a sequential log. So anything that's writing is writing to the end of it. You never write to the middle of the binary log. So if something's in the middle of the binary log, there's 10 processes in the middle of the binary log, they can read it and it's no longer locking out the, uh, the write thread. So now you can have simultaneous uh, binary log reads and writes, and you can have multiple binary log reads at a time. Uh, MySQL bin log rewrite DB. This is actually pretty cool. I, I don't think I've had a scenario where I need, you needed to use this in about five or six years, but this is one of those scenarios that when you need it, you really, really need it. Like let's say, um, you change the name of the database, but then you need someone to restore to a point in time or something, or the bin log has the old name of the database, you can actually say, uh, as an option to buy a skill bin log, rewrite the database from the old one to the new one. And you can use this multiple times. So let's say you change your database foo to bar and baz to back. You can do that in one command, uh, rewrite db old to new and dash. You can just call it multiple times in your MySQL bin log command. And this is for the row-based bin log. I'm guessing because the statement-based bin log, you can just use awk. Um, or when it says use x, you just say that. But that's not really the same because sometimes you call things with dot notation and whatever. So, uh, but at least with statement-based, you can attempt to change it. With row-based, you're just like, I don't know, it's just data. How do I change that? Um, and if you use it with dash dash database, so MySQL bin log dash dash database will only apply or will only translate what's that database. So if you say MySQL bin log database foo, it's only gonna print out stuff that was statements that applied to the database foo, or row-based stuff that applied to database foo. Um, so if you are using dash dash database, the rewrite is done first, which means that this will work what you see here. So re rewrite db old to new, and then dash dash database new, regardless of what order those are in in the command line, right? You can have dash dash database new, dash and rewrite db, it would be the same thing. So um, you may not use this, but now you're like, oh, that's great. You file it away for later, and somebody's like, oh, this database we renamed three weeks ago, now we're having problems with it, can you, you know, restore it and do that? Um, you'll now know that this is, this is one of the tools in your, in your toolkit. Partition tables, who uses partition tables here? So a few people, great. Um, index condition push down now works. This, this was, index condition pushdown was a great optimization for regular tables in MySQL 5.6. Um, and then it's now in 5.7 for partition tables. So that was one of the limitations in 5.7. Transportable table spaces. Um, what does that mean except for sounding like some kind of Doctor Who reference? Um, you can now copy partitions between instances. So that's pretty cool, um, which means backups are easier um, and being able to restore things are easier. Uh, 
Uh, you can use handler, which is very low level. So does anyone use handler instead of select here? No, I didn't think so. I didn't actually even know about handler until I was researching this. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, so it's just a low level. Instead of like insert, update, delete, select, it's a lower level way to directly manipulate tables. Um, and you can use open, close, and read instead of you know insert, update, select, delete. Uh, but you can now use handler on partition table. Clearly, that wasn't a limitation for anyone because nobody's using. Um, logs. So the MySQL command line now has a syslog option. I read this and I'm like, hasn't MySQL had syslog like forever? It has, but that's the view, the server view. So now your command line is going to have syslog. I haven't looked, but I'm hoping they put it into the connectors because I don't really care that my interactive client, when I type MySQL, yeah, okay, I might care if I have a script that runs, you know, MySQL. But I, you know, what what I really want is when the developers can't tell me what the error is that they're getting, I want to know what it is, right? So I can, I can do that in syslog. So I'm hoping it's actually in the API as well. It's coming soon to the API. Um, but it's also useful for the MySQL command line instance. Um, this was introduced in five, I actually went back to look when it was introduced for MySQL these days. It was 5.1. Um, there's a new type of undo logs for temporary tables. Uh, what is regular and compressed? Regular temporary tables and compressed, there's a new type of undo log. And so this makes it so that if um, you have a crash while you're writing to a temporary table, it's more crash safe. Um, so that's not really a performance thing. That's a, um, uh, you know, make sure your database works even for crashes kind of thing. Uh, multiple triggers. <laughs> Who here uses triggers? Who here really hates the fact that you can have one insert, one update, and one delete trigger? Five, seven, no more. I know, you think it wouldn't take them that long to do it, but it did. Um, that makes me happy. So more new stuff, explain for connection ID. So what this does is it doesn't explain on whatever's running on that connection ID. So you have a long running query and you're like, what the heck's going on? And instead of doing like a show full process list and then copy and paste and do explain, you'd be like, show, explain for connection uh, 12, whatever the connection ID is. Uh, it's only for insert, update, delete, select, and replace. And it's actually, I said I was started with show because MariaDB has show explain, you know, for a process ID, and that's in five six. So I don't know if they like shared the code, or if Oracle and Maria were coding it separately, or if Oracle saw Maria doing it, and they're like, oh, we should do that too. I don't know how it came about, but uh, they both have that. So clearly, it's a good enough feature that both of them have it. Although MariaDB has it now, and Oracle has it in five seven, whatever that. Online alter table. Who alters their tables and hates that it takes forever, right? So the more online alter tables we have, the best. That's best. Rename index. If you want to rename an index, that's for all of the storage engines. Meh, rename index, who cares? Uh, for EnoDB, there's a lot more online alter table, which is great, because that's what we all use, right? Right? Good. Well, I mean, if you have a data warehouse, you can use MySQL, uh, my ICs. Optimized table is now online. That is so awesome. Gosh, I could use that a couple weeks ago. Um, when I was optimizing a table and ran out of like, I'm starting out of disk space. Oh, delete parallel logs. Oh, is it going to work? <laughs> it was actually really, really crazy. Um, also, for a no op table rebuild. So, if you're doing alter table, foo, engine equals ZenoDB, that's also something that's unlocked. Um, increasing the var car size, but not decreasing it. You actually do this alter table T1 algorithm equals in place change column, you know, increase the bar card size. Which is great because a lot of times it's like, oh, bar card 255 because I don't want to be wrong. It's somebody's address and I want to be wrong. Now if you do like 100 characters and realize, hey, it's not long enough, it's online. Good enough. Uh, who here uses Fusion I.O.? We used Fusion I.O. for a while until our database got too big and things got really expensive. It's awesome. It's really super fast. Um, it has what's called a non-volatile memory file system on Linux, which means it's uh, atomic. So it provides this atomic write capability. And that's the same atomic <coughs> as in ACID compliance. Um, and the thing is, is that having that makes the EnoDB double write buffer redundant. So the double write buffer is it writes it twice. It writes it once to, to, um, to, one, to one place in memory and then you know, writes it to another place and then flushes to disk. Um, because you have that atomic write capability, uh, you don't need that. So what MySQL 5.7 does is it just auto disables
table it for you if you're using Fusion I.O. Uh, NVM file system. Change master without stop. So like, how, how, has anyone have like a slave error? And like, oh yeah, no, I'm going to change the master because the master crashed. And it, it gives me an error like, oh, error, this operation could be performed with a running slave. Press stop slave first. I'm like, but it's not even running. <laughs> the good news is uh, you can do that in 5.7. So if both the SQL and I.O. threads are stopped, like there was an error in the SQL and now you can't reach the master so the I.O. thread stopped, uh, you can change master auto positions. This is something that uses GTIDs, global transaction IDs. For those who don't know what GTID means. Um, if only the SQL thread is stopped, you can change, so you can do change master to relay log file, relay log position, master delay. So there's not much you can change if the SQL thread stopped because these are all the I.O. variables, basically. Uh, but if the I.O. thread is stopped, you can change everything else. So if the I.O. thread is already stopped, like the master goes offline, but the SQL thread didn't have any errors, you can still change the master host, the master log file, the master position, or, or the GTID stuff. Everything except for master auto uh, position, because you need both the threads stopped for that. So that's pretty cool, and that will prevent me from swearing at my computer once when things, when things are going wrong. I'll still probably swear a lot of other times, but I won't get that error, so it won't make me swear. So that's everything that's new in 5.7. It's not a ton, and there aren't any like huge new features. You're like, what's, what's the big deal? Like, there's some optimizations in performance, but like, I'm not excited about it yet. Um, and that's because they're on like 5.7.4 or something right now. They're on really low releases right now because it's, it's new, right? I don't even think it's in alpha yet. I don't think they have. A, I mean, you can download it, but I guess that means it's in alpha, but there's not really anything that I'm, I'm like, oh man, I have to upgrade to 5.7 whenever it comes out because of this. Um, but usually things you know, go up to version like 10 or 11 or 12 before you get uh, some good features. So I'm not really, I'm not too worried, but I'm not, I'm not chomping at the bit. Um, MariaDB 10, though, is out, and that has a lot of great features we'll talk about in a second. So, does anybody have any questions about any of the MySQL features? Yes. Based on administration features, how, how <coughs> the performance is, is increasing or, or staying the same? Is this a link to your question? So the question is, uh, can 5.7 compared to 5.6 with these new features, is the performance going to be the same or different? And I think the answer is, you know, when we talk about performance enhancements, if you have a lot of stuff, that needs those performance and have enhancements, it'll be faster. If not, then it won't. Um, but they'll also put more performance enhancements before it's through. So if 5.6 is slow, it's going to be the same. Right, if, if 5.6 is too slow, yeah, would you, would you upgrade to 5.7? Um, so, MariaDB 5.5 is a fork of MySQL 5.5. MariaDB 10 continues the fork. So MariaDB 10 is not a fork of MySQL 5.6. However, it does add in some MySQL 5.6 features. I don't know why they chose to do it that way, but there you go. Also, MariaDB is number 10 because in MariaDB 5.5, they had, when they did MariaDB 5.1, that was the first version, then they wanted to add some features that maybe not everybody wanted. So they had versions 5.2 and 5.3. So those were all 5.1 forks. Then they forked 5.5, and I, and I don't think they have like, uh, you know, I don't think they had like, a, they had the three versions like they did before, but they decided that instead of being MariaDB 5.6, they would do MariaDB 10, so that if they needed a 10, 11, and a 12, you wouldn't have to worry about like, well, is that, you know, 5.1, 5.2, and 5.3, there was no 5.2 for MySQL, no 5.2, no 5.3 for MySQL. So now they've just made it confusing for every version. <laughs> And that way you'd at least have like the 5, 6 in there, you'd be able to tell at a glance. And then they could have like 56, 56.1, 56.2, like they could do whatever they want. But funny enough, they didn't ask me. I don't, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Clearly I'm right. <laughs> but <laughs> so there you go. Um, so Marie do 10 features. Now these are a lot more fully baked, and so these are much more exciting, which is why I like this whole until the end. GTIDs, global transaction IDs, which MySQL has in 5.6, it's, it's differently implemented. Um, so one of the good parts about having a GTID is that you now have a crash safe 
slave. Because you're not, so why is your, your slave not crash safe now? It's because your slave information is in a master dot info file. Right? So the GTID position is stored in you know, DB tables. You know, DB tables are all crash safe. Now there is a way to do that in MySQL 5.6 and up. Um, but that's not new in 5.7, so I didn't really use it. So again, this is one of those things that like, okay, well who implemented it first? And did they share code? Did they do it differently? Um, so, you know, it's kind of a leapfrog game, right? MySQL is behind in some ways and ahead in others. Multi-source replication. This means more than one master for a slave. Awesome. Um, and the code is actually by a community member, not an employee, which is pretty cool. Um, Multi-source replication, here's how it works. Change master A to, so now you're labeling. And it doesn't have to be A or B or C. It, it can be change master um, machine <coughs> one, two. Change master machine two, two. So that's kind of how you do, you know, master host equals, master user equals, all those regular change master commands with a label in front. So then you can do something like start all slaves or show all slaves status. Um, or you can do something like stop slave B or show slave B status. Now you're probably looking at this going, oh, that's really cool, but I don't have to type out all of that. I just want to do like show slave status. Is there a way that I could set a default? Like I always just want to be talking about B unless I specifically say something. And the good news is you can do that. You can set the default master connection as B. And then you can do show slave status. So that's awesome, but you also have to be careful because if you set the default and then do a show slave status, thinking you're doing you're showing all the slaves something you want to be careful about. But that's pretty, it's pretty sexy right there. I have to, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you guys, that's awesome. Um, parallel slaves. So MySQL has parallel slaves, um, but it's per DB, per database. So you have a database named foo and a database named bar, and all of your activities in database foo and then a little bit in database bar, you're not really going to get a lot of good parallelism in MySQL. Um, in MariaDB, their, their stuff is parallel even within tables. It actually figures out what's independent of, of each other and then runs that stuff. But it does preserve the commit order. Also pretty cool. Um, and then it also it adapts the master's load. So um, I don't think this is something that you can really configure. It just kind of does it automatically. Things are fast. Storage engines. MariaDB loves storage engines, right? You're not just getting like your MyISO and then you're TokuDB, which has been around for a while and is a pretty good uh, uh, one. And we're going to talk about most of these um, in the next couple of slides. Open Query Graph, so if you want to um, use a graph storage engine for graph databases. Um, that, I'm not going to talk about Open Query Graph because it's been around like forever. Uh, but you can go look, at, look, look it up, Open Graph. Um, the Connect Storage Engine, which is really awesome. storage engine, which is also pretty neat if you're using Cassandra. Is anyone here using Cassandra? Awesome. Great. Uh, so the sequence storage engine, which is also kind of new, and the threaded storage engine. So clearly like TokuDB and OQGraph, those aren't new in MariaDB 5, in MariaDB 10, but they are uh, new to be like being packaged with it. So TokuDB is great for billions of rows and terabytes of data. It's 10 to 20 times faster for inserts. Inserts. It's also fully open source. Um, you get nine, up to 90% compression, and I've actually used it. Like we use it for our, one of our DataZilla projects, so um, I can attest to the fact that it does a good job. Um, and there's no fragmentation. It's not that there's no fragmentation, but there's like there's little enough to be statistically insignificant uh, because of the way they do stuff. They don't use regular B trees for indexing. They use something and it's just indexing and storing stuff. We use something called fractal trees, uh, which is really, really awesome. And there's some videos on YouTube if you like search fractal trees, you'll find the guys from Tokyo talking about that. Um, and it also has complete online all the table. You want to add columns, you want to add indexes, it's all online. Cassandra storage engine, um, it uses MySQL to access Cassandra. So you have to have existing Cassandra database in there. Um, and so you're using what's familiar to you, the SQL, and it's a way to do things like joining Cassandra and MySQL tables, which is pretty cool, um, or connect tables. So we'll talk about the connect storage engine in a second, but it, you can think of it for now as federated on crack, so you can kind of join, 
Sandra with tables from, I don't know, Postgres or Oracle or files on your desktop. Like, it's, it's kind of cool. Um, it has a flexible schema using dynamic columns, which is another feature in MariaDB in general. You don't have to use the Cassandra storage engine for this. And I'll talk about those in a second. I'll talk about them now. So dynamic columns, this is pretty cool. So one of the, one of the really cool things that people like about NoSQL is a flexible schema, right? You have a user group, you want to write down people's email addresses and what user groups they've gone to. But then maybe you want to start adding in other fields, um, what their favorite kind of pizza is. Are they a vegetarian? Um, do they show up five minutes late? Maybe we shouldn't let those people RSVP. Right? So now you're coming up with new, more and more columns, and you need to add more and more columns, which means a not online alter table, and things get a little weird. Um, and then some people don't have certain data, right? <laughs> Um, so you have something like a blob data type that you call stuff, right? So that's your field. So you have a field and a table called stuff, and it's a blob data type. This is where you're going to put all of your dynamic columns. It's really one column that happens to be dynamic. And then what you do is use a function called column create. So you say, oh, like update table set stuff equal to column create, you have a key, and you have key value pairs. So what's in the column create function is even number parameters. Why even? Because whatever key, you have to have a value. But you can have something like key one and key three, but not key two. So that's the whole point. It's kind of flexible. Um, maybe you have a store and you're selling things. Uh, do you guys have Newbury Comics down here? I thought that was an only Boston thing. It is like a Boston thing, yeah. Um, do you have anything like, you know what it is then. Forbidden what Planet. What did you say? Forbidden Planet. Put some Forbidden Planet, planet yeah. yeah. Kmart's Comics. There you go. So something like that. Where they sell, they don't just sell comic books, right? They sell DVDs and CDs, and they sell like stuffed animals and things like that, and, like Angry Birds or whatever, paraphernalia, and incense or whatever. So they might have a database of stuff they sell that has a price, but maybe they sell T-shirts and posters, and so they have a description, um, or they have a size, right? So T-shirts have a size, um, and T-shirts have a price, but CDs don't have a size. They just have a price. So you could have something that says, okay, what is it? It's a T-shirt. Um, you know, the name of something, that's a regular column. The price is a regular column. But then the parameters, right, the stuff in it is, um, is a dynamic column, right? So a poster doesn't have a size, but a t-shirt does. Um, if you want to get the information, you can say get, right, get the key, get key one or get key three. Um, and if you want to see if it exists, this is a Boolean, it return zero or one. So let's say you want to do a report to say, show me everything that has a size. You might say, well, show me the field where column exists, you know, size equals one. Um, you can nest these if you want. So you can have a dynamic column within a dynamic column if you really want. Um, yeah. And so I, I don't have an example because that's, I do have an example, but it's, it's complicated. So. Uh, are there any performance benefits of uh, using dynamic columns uh, with respect to real things? So the question is, uh, is there a performance improvement?
and my school is multi? What is it in? What group is it in? As well as, here's the value, here's the parameter. So you could actually set this up on all of your machines to have a connect table that looks at your my.cnf, and then you can easily query your tables and say, did I set, I don't know, EnoDB up for pool sites? Um, that's pretty cool. XML, DBF, FMT, these are kind of ways, DBF and FMT are used by other systems. Um, it also has a merge functionality, so it's actually called a TPL table type, which is um, like the old merge table type where you'd have my IC tables. Um, the cool part about MariaDB's implementation of this is that you don't have to have, the tables don't have to be the same schema. You can have two tables where one table has half the columns of the other, and it will still work. Um, the merge table or the table table, the table type of table, will have to probably have the half columns, but you can still do it. So then they can use different storage engines. It's pretty pretty robust. Um, it also can connect, you know, federated to ODBC or other MySQL. Um, there's a catalog table type, which is um, metadata from other systems. So, you know, one of the things I love about MySQL is that it's so easy to use, right? Show databases, show tables. How do you do that in Postgres? How do you do that in Oracle? How do you do that in SQLite? Um, the catalog table type does that for you. So now you can like select from the catalog in MySQL without having to know like, oh, it's actually like DG stat variables or whatever it is. Isn't it just like information schema? Isn't it just like information schema then? Yes, but what you're doing is you're connecting to a remote server. So let's say you connect it to Postgres with, with, a, with a kind of a federated storage type on the connect. Let's say you connect to Postgres, but now you want to know what columns it has without, you know, but you don't know how, what's show create table. You don't know what that is for the Postgres database. You connect the catalog to the Postgres database, and then you can query that table. So it is like information schema, except you don't know what information schema is on these other systems. So the question is, with these tables, and I'll, I'll just uh, expand it to all of them, is this a dynamic reconstruction or does it materialize and stores it on disk? It's dynamic, so it goes and will query that. The catalog is, it just reads from whatever the other database is. So if you're reading from another MySQL database, it's going to have what that has. Um, the good news is, completely unrelated to this question, but related to your, your concern, that um, MariaDB actually has storage engine independent statistics, which are a little better. And uh, that's actually, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But your question was, what's the performance overhead? Clearly there's some latency, some network latency, if you're going across the wires. Um, but, you know, other than that, it's pretty much kind of the same thing, right? There's a little more latency because, you know, I mean, it's still coded in C, right? So you still have whatever. And how, how much does any new function take in overhead? It's not like it's performance schema that's saving stuff to a table, so not having that materialization means it's a little more performant than otherwise, but um, the answer is depends how often you use it, right? I don't know, it's hard to, it's hard to quantify. Um, it also does, does anyone use pivot tables? Okay, but you've heard it, it's definitely a thing that people do. It's kind of an aggregation type thing. Um, it's funny, because like, I think everyone's heard of it, but you're like, well now explain it to me, you're like, it's a thing, and <laughs> That's how it works. Um, so anyway, the Connect storage engine actually has a way to do pivots and also unpivots, which is pretty cool, if that's something you need to do. Um, and then, this is my favorite. Uh, you know, I said that the Connect storage engine was my favorite thing in the MySQL ecosystem, and I think my favorite table type in the Connect storage engine is the file system. So what you do with this is you give it a path, and then it like, lists all information about the file itself. Um, which you can change the columns in the table to be to represent all the information you want. So now you can do something like, you know how um, you might look for fragmentation by comparing the .idp file on disk to the um, to the information schema, and then be like, well, if it's more than like 10 or 20 percent different, then maybe it's fragmented. Now you can do this by having the file system as a table, and you can do a table. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. Um, he said, wow. That's not exactly what he said. He used different words, but like it was like, wow. So um, the interesting thing is that MariaDB, I love MariaDB, they need better people in marketing because they're talking about connect, like, oh, you can connect to other storage engines. And you know, most MySQL DBAs are like, oh, I'm pretty happy with MySQL. Like, yeah, it doesn't do everything, but I know how it works and I'm happy with it. Like, I don't really need to connect to Oracle or anything like that. I'm gonna connect Postgres, who cares? Um, but like, the stuff that isn't even connecting to other databases is 
so awesome. Uh, and this is what I'm doing. Oh my gosh. So have you guys ever been in this situation? Tell me if you've ever been in this situation. If you look at this table and somebody has decided to put like a comma safe or a list of stuff in it, right? That never happens, right? Everyone always normalizes their schemas. This is the ideal world, right? So you can actually do lists of objects and reports on them in ways that are fast and indexed. In, yeah, it's called the X column, X C O L.
that way as well. Um, I think it's more impressive to do it this way, right? Because then you, you see everything there. So we're zero not in. Well, why are we using zero? Because what we're doing is we're going to select. Um, so we have here the where. Here we go. Laser. How do they work? Uh, where S2 sequence is less than the square root of that. So what we're saying is this.
I'm not really a programmer, so um, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so that's a way to kind of go underlying the, the main app, the table, and uh, spec storage engine does have it. Um, so this is all we're going to talk about the storage engines. Does anyone have any questions about the storage engines? Before I get to more sexy things that uh, Marie Yuki does. Although, I think, I mean, I, I happen to be
pay to do a job. And hopefully it's faster for the other person. Other optimizer uh, enhancements. I already said this. Do, do um, you know if you can actually specify that to the optimizer when you do the query? Can you specify block hash points to the optimizer? Yeah. No. It just, it op that, that's its job to optimize. So hopefully it does it right. I know, I know, it's iffy. It doesn't always do its job well. specifically set, and you actually have to specifically set it. Um, there are fantastic graphics on how this works in the knowledge base, so I really recommend you go and look at that after uh, after the, the podcast here. That is a visual, not a podcast. I do a podcast every week, so that's it's in my brain. Um, after, after the show tonight, go home, um, look at that. The, so the deal is, on the disk, records are not in the same order as they are in the index. It's kind of the point of an index, right, is that you have stuff right at your disposal, even though on the disk, right, so you might have an index records one, two, three, but on the disk, the, you know, record one is here, record three is here, record two is here. Um, so the multi-range read optimization sorts the rows found in disk order. So let's say you, you want to get all the information from a table where records are, let's say, greater than seven. ID is less than seven, let's say. So you have seven, seven uh, rows that you sorted. Then the multi-range read optimization comes in and puts those seven rows in a row buffer, sorts that row buffer to say, okay, where is this on disk? So instead of saying, go get me record one, then go get me record two, then go get me record three, it might say, go right get me record six, and then four, and then seven, and then two, because that's the order they are in on the disk. Um, so less seeking, right? Your disk head is seeking less if you have a magnetic disk. It's a huge win. Um, the knowledge base said it's it's also a little bit of a win for SSDs, but I was trying to figure out why that would be. Because uh, a hash that hash doesn't really matter when there's no seeking. Um, but you know, that's what they said. It is slower for smaller data ranges. If you have a data range that fits into the disk slower, and also if you have like a limit with a small number, an order by a limit with a small number, this optimization is slower. So it's slower for small data ranges, but with small limits. Um, and if used, explain, the explain extra field, where you have extra like using index, using where, it has row ID ordered scan. So if you see that, it means it's using it. But you do have to turn it on, um, and this is how you turn it on. Optimizer switch equals MRR equals on. So you can have more than one optimizer switch. This is kind of like SQL mode. You can have a whole bunch. This is one of the ones you can turn off. An optimizer switch is something that you can fully control in MySQL 5.6. Um, and in the little feature matrix, they're like, well, you can partially control it in MariaDB 10. So this is one of the things you can control in MariaDB 10. Subquery enhancements. Who here has heard that MariaDB is fantastic for subqueries? Yeah, so these are, this is, these are some of the reasons why. Uh, it has a subquery cache, which I promise works much better than the regular query cache in MySQL. Um, it has a fast explain on subqueries, so instead of having to actually do the whole subquery and then explain it, which is how it used to work, it's a lot faster. Um, there's an optimization that changes an exists subquery into an in subquery, which is pretty good, especially for subqueries that aren't correlated. It makes it much faster. Um, this exists to in optimization does not handle aggregate functions, things with group by or having, um, and then a couple of like edge cases. So it's not every subquery that's going to benefit from this, but many do. And if you've ever done, if you did like a blind benchmark where you're like, okay, well, let's take MySQL 5.5 and MariaDB, you know, or let's take MySQL 5.6 and MariaDB 10 and do a bake-off, and this is faster, but I don't know why it's faster, um, this might be it. So, that's all I have for like new features in MariaDB and My MariaDB 10 and MySQL 5.6. MariaDB seems to be like innovating more. They seem to be doing cooler stuff. Like even, and it's not really a fair comparison because MariaDB 10 is out right now, and MariaDB and MySQL 5.7 is just kind of in its pre-baked stage. But even when you think about like what's in 5.6 versus what's in 10, I feel like MariaDB is kind of doing more out there stuff. Here's a Cassandra storage engine, you know. 
here's this. In 5.6, you have a way to do no SQL, but if you get like one table, and that's not really useful. Um, so I feel like, this is my personal opinion, that they're doing like the cooler stuff, right? They did the connect storage engine, and instead of just being like, okay, it's like better, it gets a little bit better. Now they're like, oh, do pivot table. <coughs>
again, it's one of these things that if you're just getting into MySQL administration, it's really for beginners and intermediate people. Um, and it's, you know, the basics are really still the same, right? You still turn on MySQL, you still want to use EWB, this is how you set the buffer pool size. Uh, if you know all the material in this, you can easily catch up by saying, okay, what are the new variables? What are the new functions? So, um, so yeah. All right. Well, I'll go back to the mic then. Good. So uh, at this point in the presentation, you can do question, uh, the, the not question, sorry, the quiz. We have a number of books in the back, and we have a number of questions from Sherry. So um, everyone's kind of ready. The, the rules are basically raise your hand. Uh, if you think you know the answer, we'll let you call in. We'll try to get to the first person who answers. Please raise your hand and don't shout it out until the first person answers. Um, so first question I'm going to ask is, is anybody actually using MySQL 5.7? Great question, right? Because like, clearly, like you're you're super awesome if you've downloaded like the alpha version. I haven't even done that. Um, is anyone here using MariaDB ten? Oh, that was the first, first hand, Carlos. You started using it two weeks ago, and why did you start using it? You were trying to you were trying to solve. Trying to solve a, a, a problem for your company. Is it a confidential problem, or is it something? Can you summarize it for somebody who maybe they're not on the read to be ten? And it's a confidential. It's a confidential. Thing. Okay. So the nature of the problem, or the use case that it can solve. Is it like use case? Was it? I mean, can you tell us what this was like? Is it related to subquery performance? Is it related to subquery performance? Okay. Oh yeah, we have a we have a bit. Um, oh, so next.
Thanks, everyone. Blooms, uh, Thank you so much. Blooms staff.